Hello and welcome back to the Agassino Zinga Show, episode number 537. That is the Agassino Zinga Show, episode number 537 with I, your host, Agostino Zinga. How you doing? How you feeling? Great. Amazing. Good to know. If it's your first time checking the show via YouTube, you know what to do. Smash like, hit subscribe, leave a comment down below. That'd be greatly, greatly appreciated as per usual. And if you're watching it or listening to it via some version of a podcast app, then please leave me a five star review. Um, Spotify now have a new feature where you can leave reviews up on there. So if you want to leave a review for the kid over on Spotify, then do that. You can leave anywhere between five to one stars. I'm not really bothered which one you do leave, but leave something for the kid. Let everyone know that you're enjoying the show and you want others to also enjoy it and give it a chance. And of course, support via Patreon is welcome to at patreon.com for just Agostino. You get a link to that in my description of the show. You can find that. I've already uploaded the bonus episode yesterday. It's called Lips in Your Mum. So if you want to, if you're in curious about some of the shows I put up on Patreon, Beyond the Pain Wall, then definitely check out Lips in Your Mum. It's available now on Patreon. Um, you can get it for only $1, the equivalent of £1 per month. And there's other tiers too, but that's the entry tier. So if you want to get access to all my bonus content, which I upload once per week only on Patreon, then definitely make sure you lock in over there at patreon.com for just Agostino. The link is going to be in the description. The bonus episode for this week's already up on there. So check it out check it out but yeah how you doing i hope you're well wherever this may find you i'm doing pretty fine i've got myself a nice little healthy green juice here that i've pressed myself as you can see can you see that right um it's been a long time pressing it because i don't have the best blender in the world or juices or whatever it may be called but you know i get it done i make it happen apart from that what else i've been doing um I kind of did the first day of 75 hard the other day, which I'm going to have to start again on Monday. So I'm having to stop and then start again, which is supposed to be I've read via the subreddit of the 75 hard. That's a usual common thing that happens when you first begin that challenge because it's so difficult, right? Because essentially you're having to, I think the, the difficult, the hardest bit about it is having to work out twice per day, right? Eat every day for 75 days. I think I can do once per day. I think everyone can do that. It's not difficult. It's still hard, but essentially you're going to have to go to the gym once and then outside once unless you've got one gym at home but you're going to have to basically lift weights and do some form of cardio whether it's walking running um skipping riding a bike whatever you're gonna have to go outside every single day which obviously you know during the pandemic is a bit of a stretch because i've you know most of my time has been spent indoors whether it's working or relaxing so that takes a bit of a uh, time to kind of switch over in your head okay cool i have to go outside i have to actually step outdoors and do all that sort of stuff so that's kind of a bit of a thing that i have to kind of get around but apart from that it's not too shabby i think the reading of the book thing like i said is easy the drink of the water is easy the following a diet is easy i just think it's having to leave your house twice per day that's very very difficult to do i found it so far unless other people have other solutions maybe you have a couple of kettlebells at home that you just use so in case you don't go outside you can still get something in but that's going to be okay so obviously starting now on monday so you'll see the first vlog on that one later on on monday if you're interested if you're checking out as well that'll be there um what else has been happening obviously the, the fallout from united losing um the other day against wolves is still ongoing um everyone's coming out and making excuses people are leaking stuff to the press which has just been crazy to see um and in general i think we've all come to the conclusion that united maybe aren't as good maybe the club no, the, the, the players that we have aren't as good as we think they are and maybe we're just kind of putting ex heaping expectation on them um that they probably don't deserve or they probably don't warrant right they're probably just because we obviously still have these memories of all these greats that came before them right the rios the ronaldo's the vidiches the the roonies the Ronald yeah the gigs the skulls all these guys the keens from yesteryears but these guys are nowhere near that we're nowhere near that as a club, as an infrastructure. Um, obviously, success-wise on the pitch, we've, we've been nowhere near that in a long, long time. So maybe it is slightly unfair to heap that kind of pressure on players who generally aren't that great. And it's not their fault they're not that great, right? Because um, it's interesting today, I've been getting a lot of, um, oh no, recently on social media, I've been getting a lot of uh, pushback from certain people regarding Phil Jones. Because obviously he played pretty well against Wolves the other day. But still, you know, a player like Phil Jones at an elite club wouldn't be at United, right? He would have left already or he would have got kicked out of the club or he would have been freezed out. But he wouldn't be an option to bring on into the pitch, right? Because you'd have other options, you'd, you know, you'd kind of move on from it. And, you know, but 
because of because of how badly Maguire's played and how shaky Varane's been since he's come back and Bailly being Eric Bailly, the fans just want some level of stability. So when you've seen somebody who you recognise who's been at the club for a while have a standard 6 out of 10, 7 out of 10 game, it can gas you up and start making you forget or rewrite history in Phil Jones' case, right? And people are forgetting the horror shows that he's kind of put on in defence. People are forgetting the, you know, the memeable faces. People are forgetting that he spent essentially two and a half years, most of which hasn't been injured, just collecting a wage at United, showing no inkling that he wants to go play football despite being a former international yeah, for England. Um, this is also somebody who was billed to be the next, what um, what, what did um, Alex Ferguson call him? The next Brian Robson or something, right? Um, and supposedly now, because he's had one good game, people are having sympathy for him and saying he's had a half tight, half time, and blah, de, blah, blah, blah. I don't give a shit. This is elite level football. Elite level football, you're required to perform at the elite level, game in, game out. You're only as good as your last game. There is no sympathy. There is no waiting for you to develop and get good because everyone's job's on the line. A manager signs a star player and they don't perform. They have to drop them and get somebody else in because if not, it's going to be their job on the line very, very soon because players tend to outlast managers for the most part. So there's a lot of pressure all around, right? From sponsors to brands um, to the club as well. I'm assuming a lot of, you know, players have, you know, um, finished uh final table finish kind of incentives locked into their contract so if we finish our top four he gets maybe a little bump or if we win a trophy you get a little extra here extra there so there's a lot of pressure on those on, on players in general right so they have to perform because you know maybe those bonuses help to support an entire family maybe help to support an entire community you never know but it's a, it's the it's what you kind of sign up for when you decide to go to a club like that right when you're when you're ambitious you kind of have to kind of you know accept that level of responsibility so people out there kind of having sympathy for phil jones and feeling as if like he's been wronged in his career are just absolutely nuts but again it speaks to the complete um i don't know how to describe it it just speaks to the complete it just speaks to the confusion of the united fan base at the moment there doesn't seem to be a cohesive point of view um we can't really agree on anything and a lot of people have said that because we've got a global fan base, we've got fans from all over the world that support the club. Um, they see the football differently, but I just, I don't agree. Every club for the most part in top leagues in Europe has a global fan base. Maybe not to our extent, but they definitely have fans, you know, in countries outside of, of the UK who are fanatical about the club as much as we are. I don't think it's that. I just think because we've had so much success over the years, some of our fans just think because we had so much success in the past that we're gonna we're kind of guaranteed or owed or deserving or entitled to get some in the future not kind of understanding that football moves things change on um it's, it's, i think sorry things change over time uh you know the, the competition outside of the top six let alone the in the top six is fucking frightening we have teams like brentford coming up in the championship playing amazing football with great infrastructures <clears throat> with coaches who have a real point of view of how they see the game not just trying to play pragmatic football just trying to secure survival and get that you know survival money or parachute payments whatnot no they're actually trying to make you know make use of their time in the league entertain the fans maybe create some magical premier league moments and just you know kind of continue on that legacy right of, of great premier league games so this idea that we're going to suddenly get things right and football's going to wait for us to figure it out is insane. And then this also kind of, you know, heaping loads of expectation on some players, but then also excusing some players for their clear lack of ambition, clear lack of drive um, and clear lack of quality. It's all it is really. It's not really a personal thing when it comes to field gender. It's just the guy's not good. But unfortunately, because we've, we've been so poorly run, he's kind of returned to form as coincided with our star captain, our 80 million pound defender in Harry Maguire playing like absolute crap so when you see somebody playing normally playing like a standard average game it kind of makes you think oh this is what we're missing out on but again imagine how frightening that is only only at United could we sign an England international in Harry Maguire right um 80 million off the back of Virgil van Dijk signing thinking we're going to get you know a version of that which we didn't like I've always said about Harry Maguire I think a lot of his issue has come comes down towards his price tag I think his price tag really inflated how people look to him as a player and that's normal because I think transfer fees always play that role I think most people wouldn't want that to happen but that's just the standard 
um, way that football is viewed these days. If you pay a lot of money for a player, you're going to expect a lot of results from them. Look at what has happened to Nicolas Pepe. It's not his fault that he's not that great, but that price tag of 70 million is going to hang over his head like a dark cloud until he's able to kind of justify the feat or he flops and goes somewhere else. It just is what it is. You just have to get on with it. And unfortunately for Aaron Maguire, he's never really justified that price tag. It's never been, never been a thing. And obviously the armband is heavy, weighing heavy on him, the badge, the responsibility, blah, 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 blah. Um, and only only United will really have the bad luck where we sign an England international for 80 million. We give him the captain's armband. He ends up playing absolutely great for the first, what, six, eight months. Then he plays absolute shit after. And then we're starting to wonder to ourselves, how, how are we ever going to get rid of this guy? And we're not. We're stuck with Harry Maguire for at least five years, especially because he's English. If he was a foreigner, maybe he'd, he'd, he'd be gone now, right? Or he'd be gone sooner than that. But because he's an English player, we're going to make it work. We're going to try and find a solution. But essentially, he's not a defender that will ever win you the league. That's something that we all can kind of agree on. You're not going to win a Champions League with Harry Maguire. You're not going to win the league with Harry Maguire. It's just not going to happen. He's not that kind of player. Maybe an odd FA Cup here and there. But in terms of the elite competitions, especially at the league over 30 plus games, the Champions League against some of the best teams in, in Europe, some of the best attacking talent, midfield talent, whatever. He's not going to cut it. So we're, we're in this weird place where suddenly Phil Jones is our kind of saviour. But again, let's not rewrite history. Phil Jones has been terrible for the majority of his Man United career when he's not been injured. He gets injured way too often. If people complain about Bailly, I'm pretty sure Phil Jones has, hasn't beat on injuries. He's made out of fucking plastic. Um, and just a terrible overall kind of indictment of how we are as a club that we've had someone like him collecting wages the same with someone like a wine matter just hanging around not playing and just kind of taking up space really in terms of squad numbers and whatnot like just taking up space that squad number could have easily off place could have easily been given to a young player to get a bit of experience get him some minutes but just having these pro these kind of veterans quote unquote still at the club it's just a complete waste of time really but you know what do i know and then what's up they doing um I then also watched the Lex Friedman and Tim Dillon interview. I thought that was pretty decent. Um, I think I watched both, actually. I did watch both. I think the one that Lex did with Tim and the one Tim did with Lex, that was really interesting. Um, I found the Lex Friedman interview or interviews overall a little bit tiresome. I had to kind of give them a break, more so because of Lex. That whole, like, um, lead with love, I block you with love, I come with love, love will, rule, love will save the world sort of stuff is annoying. Uh, maybe I'm being um, too cynical about it, but I just think it's um, it's. I think um, Tim didn't touch on it as well when he said something along the lines of, "Oh, you think everybody? I think kind of the Gary Vee thing, right? Where they think everyone has a business in them. Everyone's an entrepreneur. Everyone can be creative. Everyone can be an artist." It's like no, some people just want to live a somewhat normal life, be able to put food on the table, you know, clothes on their back, a roof over their head. And do the normal things like watch a couple of reality TV shows and maybe go on a holiday a year. They don't want more than that. They're just more than happy with that. They're content with maybe just raising a family, um, you know, whatever. And this idea that everyone's an entrepreneur is just brain dead. And also is proof that you probably only hang around with a certain group of people who kind of would lead you to believe that. Because, you know, you only have to hang around with a couple of fashion people um, during fashion week to come away from it thinking fashion is going to save the world. It, it can happen to all of us, right? So especially when you start talking to people who are real movers and shakers in their industry, people who have great insights, experience, they can legitimately make you believe that, you know, an overlook or an und or a seam or a, a pattern cutting exercise is somehow going to cure all of our ills in the world, which it obviously isn't because life is way more complicated than that. And most people don't give a crap about those little niches and whatnot. Um, and then they touched upon, you know, obviously Lex's infatuation with Putin, which I never really understood. I don't really get that whole thing, especially for someone like him who lives in America and gets to see um, the Russian propaganda through the eyes of Western world or whatever it may be. It's just an odd thing. And especially for me, too, having read or being in the process of reading this book called um, Putin's People by Catherine Belton. Right. This one here. And um, obviously, um concerning all the stuff that's happening in kazakhstan i think you know russian troops were uh, brought in to quell some of the uprising this is off the back of 26 or so people dying um you know started off as a peaceful protest against fuel hike prices and then suddenly it descended into everybody just losing their shit and essentially using this opportunity to you know voice their frustration with the government which led to, i think to the prime minister resigning 
which then led to the president coming out saying that the you know the armed forces should go out and shoot protesters without warning like absolute looney tune stuff right and then they bring in the russian troops by plane <laughs> putin that comes out to help out to quell the uprising because of course you know he can't have any he's not really a fan of people uprising and being awoken and realizing how, what kind of conditions they're living in you know the man who allegedly has um oft many many political rivals and opponents i think there's currently one now still in prison right i forgot his name the one that was um the one that ran away to berlin and shit and they they finally got him or he no, he actually came back to face the music he's currently in prison now at the moment and then he got lex friedman saying that somehow he's going to interview putin and what he's going to ask him some really insightful questions that are going to make him maybe believe that democracy is actually a good thing and he shouldn't have an ironclad on the you know um, he shouldn't have the ironclad on the leadership of Russia forever and ever and ever. Like, I don't know. I don't get it. I really don't. It's really, really bizarre. Um, so I, I've definitely stopped listening to that podcast often. Lex Friedman show uh, podcast. Sorry, I still think it's in terms of value per podcast or value per, per whatever that metric is that you can use in terms of every episode is chock full of value. And he legitimately, I think Tim Dillon made a point too. He legitimately has some of the best guests in terms of podcasts out there that I can definitely say, definitely. Obviously, it lends, it leans more to the side of stuff that he's interested in when it comes to AI, robotics and whatnot, engineering. But overall, in terms of the, the, the brevity of guests and how deep they go in conversations and whatnot, it's, it's, it's amazing. And then he has timestamps in the main podcast and he has really detailed clips or little clips, sorry, like many, many little clips on different topics that get uploaded straight away. So like really well run show. I have to give the guy props and obviously he researched his guests really well. He's always got really insightful questions. I think the Elon Musk interview was superb. One of the better ones we've had, we've, we've seen of him recently, which obviously helps because I think they're quite friendly. Lex and Elon but god damn it man everything else like the Putin stuff is just so weird especially when you have to honestly after reading books like this which again it's a bit skewed because it's a you know a westerner kind of talking about Russian politics and maybe there's more to the story that we don't know I'm op open to that I'm open to the idea that maybe the way that we've kind of been told to view Putin is maybe similar to how we were told to view people like Gaddafi and whatnot granted but for the most part, we can agree that, you know, Putin isn't a fan of his political rivals or people who speak up, you know, or who have some not so, you know, flattering words to say about him as a person or his family or whatnot. And usually they either get ran out of town, they get disappeared or they get washed up somewhere, you know, on the shore somewhere. Which I mean, found with, you know, non-suspicious reasons of passing away. Like we know the guy's a bit of a thug in that regard, a bit of a gangster in that regard. So for Lex to kind of be like, I lead with love, I lead with love and not see quite plainly that this guy doesn't believe in love. <laughs> the only love he believes in is control, right? And power and, <laughs> and um, um, authority, right? Like that's the only thing he believes in. The only, yeah, you know I mean, the only love that he believes in is, is the love of locking shit down. Um, but you know, well, whatever. Um, but definitely recommend you check it out. Um, Tim Dillon interviews Lex Friedman. It's really fun. I think it's the best, better one you're gonna get out of kind of someone interviewing Lex because he gets to be a bit funny and let his hair down a bit and not be so uptight and have that weird monotone, boring tone that kind of sends sends you to sleep. Sometime I think it was really fun on that one. So definitely check that out if you haven't already. That's a recommendation I'd give to you. But yeah, let's move on from that. So um, this is an article courtesy of The Guardian um, talking about the rise of lateral flow tests and are the heroes of the pandemic are here to stay, right? And so let me read that again in the title. The rise of the lateral flow tests are those he are these heroes of the pandemic here to stay? And it got me thinking about, obviously, you know, how great these antigen tests have been despite their flaws and despite how cumbersome and annoying it is to do the test itself at home, right? Because I don't really have a good gag reflex, don't say nothing funny um i've also feel uncomfortable putting stuff up my nose because i've had nasal polyps done before so some of my nasal glands can be can sometimes get irritated really easily and i've got allergies and whatnot it's just annoying right it's not the best experience for me i know i know um put away your tiny violins right but in general these little lateral flow test things especially in the uk especially in recent months have been a lifesaver because they've essentially allowed all of us to have a somewhat quote-unquote normal life 
with the ability to kind of you know get tested before we go to a club or we go to a bar we go to a restaurant or whatever establishment that requires it and to kind of go about you know living your quote-unquote everyday life um and i would imagine for some people it has also kind of been a great way to sort of kind of regulate your exposure to the outside world right so if you're going on holiday or whatnot or you're going somewhere or whatever you're visiting people you kind of have it in your mind that you need to test you need to make sure as well you have enough time in case if you are positive so you can recover before you go and meet people do you know what I mean it kind of plays in your head so i think that whole thing is a real good the whole the introduction of it has been really amazing the only downside of it nowadays has been supposed to be some news coming out that they're they're gonna be stopping giving them out for free at the moment you can get them from the government website and get get sent i think seven packs or something to yourself but now so i think supposedly supplies are low and they also want to prioritize them for people who actually need them so obviously if you've got symptoms you can go and order them obviously not for free but um and obviously leave them for the uh medical departments to use too when need be but i still think looking back now there is one positive to come from this because there's not a lot to come from the covid and the lockdowns i think there's probably been more bad than good one of the positives has been the advent of these antigen tests and the ease at which they, be, they can be used and the accuracy too considering they are used at home it's been pretty amazing to see so quickly read this article it says here um once obscure diagnostic devices lateral flow tests have had a rocky path to mainstream use but some experts now view that their rise of to ubiquity as a heroic step in the fight against covid19 and say that they could be here to stay as the first wave of covid crashed down in early 2020 governments scrambled to secure ppe ventilators and reagents for laboratory testing behind the scenes um, some had already foreseen a role for the emergency test style kits the quote here we started thinking about it in late 2019 when we were at the international trade shows where it was becoming a hot topic, said David Campbell, the director of the Derby-based diagnosis company SureScreen, which has been in the lateral flow test business for more than 25 years and brought one of the first antigen tests in Europe to the market. We'd done a lot of work on the influenza and some work on MERS. We thought initially that it would be a niche product. The first COVID lateral tests were designed to detect antibodies. At the time, the governments optimistically and wrongly hoped that the proof of the prior infection could act as a freedom pass, allowing people to return to life as normal in the knowledge that they were immune to the virus. By 2020, the government had announced that the purchase of 17.5 million lateral flow tests designed, um, sorry, lateral flow tests describing them as a game changer, but this proved to be a misstep. They absolutely didn't work. They were awful, said Professor John Bell of the Regis Professor of Medicine of Oxford University. There were a lot of people running around trying to sell tests that didn't work, trying to make a fast buck. It was pretty scandalous. And that was the start point of, of for the lateral flow test. The orders were quietly cancelled. The bell said one vulnerable lesson was that the need for the robust validation process. The government established a group of port of the day. By, sorry, by early 2020, many companies had switched from their focus antigen test, which was synthetic antibodies to detect proteins from the virus itself. The UK government had also moved on to Operation Moonshot, which aimed to deliver millions of tests to people's homes. Whenever I hear the word moonshot from number 10, my heart sings at Bell, but the reality is the lateral photos have delivered. It's been one of the more heroic moments of the pandemic. And I definitely, definitely, definitely agree with that one. And hopefully they are here to stay. Hopefully they don't take away the free program and we still have an ability to draw for them because I fear, you know, if there's anything I know about British people is that if you don't give them the option to be good, and to be well behaved they won't do it so if these aren't available for free and you have to pay for them i have a feeling people are just not going to take their antigen test or not take their blood flow test they'll probably fob the results if they haven't done already and it'll just lead to probably more issues so i think the fact that they're free it gives people no excuse and kind of makes it easy for them to make the right choice if you make them none if, if, if they take away the free option and make it only priced again they're not that expensive i think people are going to be a little bit more um casual in their approach when it comes to dealing with covid in my eyes i think so but again what do i know mm. and then of course touching upon the article i said about them not being free anymore it says here courtesy of the daily mail free lateral flow test to be axed within weeks mass testing devices could be limited to those with symptoms care homes hospitals and schools under plans to live with covid and the mid fears of a six billion contracts bill the only good thing to come from that headline is the fact that the government is slowly and surely going towards the model of living with the virus which i agree with obviously with some precautions right we're not doing what they're doing over in flipping florida where they're just leaving the test to go 
to basically go bad, right? To expire so that you don't have to test people. If you don't test people, it doesn't add to the numbers. The numbers don't add. Then it doesn't look like you're suffering from much COVID. And it's absolutely mad over there, but whatever, innit? I don't live there, so I don't know what their business is. But still, that's the best thing. But the idea, again, like I said, the idea of taking away the option of having free lateral flow tests, I think is going to be a bit of a misstep and will end up shooting us in the foot. Because I think, again, UK people, British people, if you don't give us the option to make a good decision, to make a sensible decision we want and if this is the case and they have to pay for them and you know you have to weigh up between paying 14 quid for electro flutters to go to a club or just fobbing the results and saving the 14 quid for a couple of beers on the way there you're probably going to do the, the the latter in it and i know you know again i'm not the most badly behaved person but i know that was something that'll be running through my head so i can only imagine what the tricksters and the cheeky guys and girls out there will be thinking about this sort of stuff so anyway it's courtesy of um daily mail it says free electoral flow tests are set to be axed as the government prepares the country to live with coronavirus without ongoing restrictions. Boris Johnson is set to announce the measure within weeks, as Sunday Times reported. The newspaper reported that the new system could mean that the free tests are only given to high-risk settings such as care homes, hospitals and schools, and people with symptoms. Contact tracing by NHS test and trace could also be scrapped. Oh, sorry, scaled back. More than six billion has been spent on the mass testing using lateral flow test devices. So usually when these kind of leaks happen ahead of time especially in the times they usually you know it's basically done it's usually cut you know you just need Boris to come and confirm it which is again concerning um let's see man what the approach is going to be it, it would be nice if they said hey this is the last week of getting them for free because at the moment you know i think for the past couple of weeks or maybe a few weeks you we've not been able to get any free tests from the government websites they've all been sold out um there's a conspiracy about it too i don't really dig in too deep on it but you can obviously buy them yourself if you want to actually purchase them but the free options are basically all sold out it seems like um, it says here a senior Whitehall source, sorry, a senior Whitehall source told Sunday Times, quote, I don't think we're in a world where we can continue to hand out free letter of photos to everybody forevermore. It's likely we'll have to move to a scenario where there's less testing, but where we have a capacity to ramp up if necessary, such as in the winter. It's an odd time to cancel it, right? Because you'd imagine off the back of this Omicron variant, which is not deadly, but super contagious, that you'd want the, these tests will be more valuable because people need to, double check and make sure that they don't have it and also supposedly the symptoms aren't as harsh as the other variant delta so this would be the perfect time to have them right this may be the time to actually ramp up productions of these lateral photos as opposed to taking them away but you know what do i know he continues to says scotland's first minister nicola sturgeon warned mr johnson that axing the universal free health flow test would be an utterly wrong-headed approach to dealing with the coronavirus again we don't want to listen to nicola sturgeon if it's up to her she'd, she'd love to live in lockdown forever so she's a bit of a mad one to listen to um blah, blah, blah. miss sturgeon so miss sturgeon said the gov scottish government had not signed up for the move but if mr johnson was really considering this it would be utterly wrong-headed hard to imagine much of this that that would be less helpful than trying to live with COVID. she, she tweeted she questioned what would happen to funding for the uk nations for testing under the parameter formula the department of health and social has yet to comment but the government source disputed the report and said it was too early to say whatever the future holds but of course when they say that it's basically confirmed so and again concerning for all of us but maybe it's kind of a little bit of a silver lining because it also means that we're maybe having a step in the right direction maybe i don't know to be a little bit optimistic on that one i'm not really sure if that makes sense but we'll see in it we'll see what happens we'll see what happens going forward but we need to have an ability, especially now within the next few weeks with this Omicron shit running rampant everywhere. Please allow us the ability to still be able to grab these antigen tests when, when need be, because, you know, without them, I think we're all going to be suffering, especially here in the UK, where people have a tendency to just do the wrong thing because it's the easiest thing to do as opposed to the right thing to do. So, you know, what can you do? What can you do? Then we want to move on from that and talk about some news that just popped up on the timeline of a, as a couple of days, a uh, couple of days ago, maybe a, a day ago. It's been confirmed via Kanye tweeting it on his account. He tweeted a picture of a contract that he signed alongside with some big wigs at Caring regarding this amazing, amazing headline. Curse your vote said Yeezy Gap engineered by Balenciaga begins. So um, essentially what's happening is that Kanye's 
long awaited collection with Gap, which supposedly was meant to be spearheaded by the designer of Mawa Lola, but I'm not too sure what's happening there. Um, supposedly this girl on Twitter said that she left soon after being announced I'm not sure if there was a creative differences or she fell out with Kanye but something happened but allegedly what was meant to happen was that the girl that designed that was that her? yeah this one the girl that makes this hat this brand was allegedly meant to be the one that was going to be doing the Yeezy Gap thing right I'm not sure if she was going to be the creator no I think it was creative director but that kind of news basically died down and we haven't really seen much in terms of the entire collection launch since the round jacket right there's not really been much else that's come out maybe the hoodie the hoodie's been something right that's come out um but those are the only the two products and of course when we saw the first press shots we saw like a bag we saw a jacket we saw some pants we saw a full head to toe look which you would imagine is what kind would want to do because he's always had this idea of kind of democratizing fashion and then it went quiet <clears throat> but then since then Kanye's relationship with Demma, former um, Balenciaga and former Vetema has basically strengthened over the last few months, it feels like, or maybe a couple of years. He was in charge of doing the creative directing for the creative direction for the Donda concept, if I'm not mistaken. Um, and just they've got really a great working relationship, it seems like, and over the last couple of months too, Kanye's been head to toe in Balenciaga. So clearly there's been some talk behind the scenes about something, but I don't think anyone expected this to be the case. And if you're a fan of what Dedman does and he's aesthetic, obviously you guys know I am. I'm a huge fanboy of his. Um, the introduction of Etima in the scene was literally me one of the times, one of the only times I think maybe I can think of recent times, apart from maybe Heidi Semen at Saint Laurent, that really got me excited for fashion again, especially in the men's side of things. I think the women's side of things, there's always things to get excited about, but the men's, it can get a bit stale, um, especially after, you know, there are, there, were, there were moments, right? Ricardo Tishi at Givon, she was a moment. Early Rick was a moment. Um, June was a moment right there are moments but in general that when when them not burst on the scene with Vetema with that kind of um central Europe eastern Europe kind of aesthetic um the shapes um the colors the, the you know the staples used in terms of the bomber jackets the hoodies like all these kind of things you know elevating these everyday streetwear staples into you know essentially um couture which is basically doing that with Balenciaga was amazing so um to see Kanye and him kind of bolster and together and have this working relationship this creative sort of bond or brotherhood has been sick to see and also again if you're a fan of the aesthetic but you can't afford the clothes the Balenciaga Vermont thing this is a great way to basically bring that to the mass market essentially it's like a heightened version of what H&M used to do right remember when they collaborated with the great and the legendary Karl Lagerfeld back in the day or Comme des Garçons and whatnot those collaborations have kind of died down for the most part it feels like um, Uniqlo still does a lot of those but for the most part you don't really see a lot of those high street collabs with designers anymore but this is kind of another level of, on top of it right this is like a creative director a brand owner himself and Kanye being able to then bring in another high level person to work on a collection basically bringing that aesthetic and kind of be able to you know provide it to the masses which is going to be sick anyway so it continues this Vogue article says the following pardon pardon me forgive me forgive me forgive me he says are you ready for this friends and collaborators Ye and demna who until recently went by their full names Kanye West and demna vasalia vasalia sorry are joining forces for the project at gap it's quite here it's a vision come true to work with gap and demna the creative director blends got to make incredible products available for everyone at all times Ye told Ye vogue so the dream that he's always had has always been rabbing on about in interviews is finally coming true i think everyone that kind of doubted him has basically got egg on their faces because he's essentially been able to do it in his own way via these collaborations that he's currently got let me stop this autoplay videos i absolutely hate them virgo i despise your autoplay videos i really do i despise them and i think everyone else does too can i pause it yeah i can cool and let's go back to the article it says the collection brings together the world famous rapper and creative hottest so and the and creative and the hottest high fashion brand on the planet right now via the ubiquitous american retailer them the debut cultural collection for ben Shaga last july was universally lauded as a triumph the 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 game meanwhile signed a giant 10-year deal with gap in 2020 and uh, only a couple of items have released so far it's attracted an off the charts level of attention when it first went on sale last summer the 200 dollar round jacket crashed app gap's website instantly sold out and now there's a red one on offer at, at, at what reseller goat for seven grand Anyone buying a round jacket for seven grand deserves to have their 
round jacket stolen in a bar or something man that's insane the jacket's good but it's not seven grand good you guys are tripping um collaborations have become a, a lingua franca of the fashion world okay let's not go let's just overlook that um if that doesn't exactly roll off the tongue it won't be long before it does because come on but let's go and get at break get prices them to clarify it says this this is very different challenge i've always appreciated that you to sorry this is a different challenge. I've always appreciated the utilitarianism and accessibility of Gap. I share some of the same sensibilities in my creative language. This project allowed me to join forces with Ye to create utilitarian fashion for all. Yet Demna and sensibilities have long been aligned. Demna says there is a certain urban minimalism and poetry in our aesthetic and also a desire to push boundaries, which I love. Engineered by Pump. Um, but in the last few months, the two have been priming the engineered by Pump. Demna Creator directed the stage sets and live streams of Ye's recent Donda listing events in Atlanta and Chicago and designed the t-shirt merch sold at, the, uh, sold at them. Ye for his part has become Blitzyaga's biggest client. Just six days ago, he was spotted in a brand's Miami boutique with an armful of shopping bags. I would still like to say, I'm not sure if it happened. I think it did happen. I think I might have saw a link to it on the website. I would still like to see a shopping shop, what he suggested, remember? When Kanye was sitting down with Drink Champs, he said, oh, I'd like to have my own Balenciaga store with my own selects like his own pool stuff that he kind of likes from the runway collections because for the most part even though you know he's kind of bought a lot of it and he has obviously more disposable income to purchase that stuff than I do the stuff that I like from it is definitely not the sign of stuff that he likes from it but I do like the way he kind of presents it and wears it himself day to day so I would like to see what he kind of thinks is core cool what he would like or what not um, I don't know how, the, how legally how they could do it or what not but so, so far what I've seen is like a link someone might have shared on like the Kanye forum where you could basically see um, items that Kanye likes or what not selected and put on the website but that's an easy kind of win for them in terms of sales um, the continuity here says first the first easy gap so the first easy gap engineered by Balenciaga drop is expected in June, so come up very soon. With a second later in the year, and who knows, maybe there'll be more down the line. Says Demna, there's very few people that I know, especially of Ye's calibre, who really understand my work so well. He makes me come out of my comfort zone and be a better designer. There's no ego when we collaborate. We have mutual drive to evolve and do something great and new. Yeah, I can only imagine, man. That's the thing with Kanye. It's always been like that, and I think creatively speaking, definitely a sick guy. Personally, you know, as a friend maybe not the greatest in the world, but when it comes to in working in that creative field and having somebody you can bounce ideas off, somebody that can maybe um, open your eyes to different pop possibilities, expand the way you think about things and your perception and your view, make you question things. There's no one better for sure. He's definitely going to make you feel 10 foot taller having to speak with him over dinner or whatnot, but friendship wise, oof, tough one. Um, so yeah, very very much looking forward to that when it drops in June, obviously, as being a bit of a whore for what the stuff that Demna does at Balenciaga and Vetemar, and obviously liking Kanye's aesthetic overall, and being a fan of the shoes, and you know, how he presents things, I'm sure it's going to be an amazing collection, I'm sure it's going to be a very unconventional in the approach, the prices are probably going to be pretty appealing, but I just hope it's worldwide, that's the only thing I'm really kind of banking on that they don't just leave it as a u.s thing but you know the legality of these things is interesting what markets they can sell it in it's gonna especially with the with the pandemic at the moment the supply chain issues i'm not too sure if it's going to be as easy as i think it is but or as easy as i'd hope it would be but we'll see in it we have to wait and see on that one then of course um i want to quickly add on this one i think this is a quick little roundup just to kind of finish it this is courtesy of glossy this lady called rachel tashian who if i'm not mistaken works at gq star had some really um great words to say about the um Ye yeezy gap collaboration with balenciaga that i thought really surmised it really well i'm gonna quickly pull up the quote here where is she do, 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 do. let's just put let's just put our oh, find Rachel there you go cool so this is a quote courtesy of um, a website called glossy.co.uk sorry glossy.co which basically um, another place kind of covering the deal that Yeezy's doing with Balenciaga and this Rachel lady said the following great way to kind of surmise um, how important and how amazing this whole thing is so this is the following um, Easy Gap engineered by Balenciaga collection is expected to be more exclusive collection like collabs Balenciaga has taken part in with brands like Gucci and the Hacker Project the GQ fashion critic Rachel Tashian told Glossy this really fits into Kanye's original intention and mission statement even before joining the Gap to democratize fashion and also to change the popular design at the level of Steve Jobs you can now see he wants to do it you can now see sorry how he wants to do it he's bringing in Demna as his sort of Johnny Ive he's taking his insane level of avant-garde fashion 
and credibility and interest in design and combining it with um, Kanye's genius and reach for the gap. Kind of genius and the reach of gap. If you think about the way that iPhone reconfigured the way everything looks to make everything mm -hmm. so sleek and minimalist with those rounded corners, that's a level of change Kanye wants to have. He wants people to have an air conditioners in design that are influenced by what he's got well, what he's doing at the gap. So definitely, definitely great words and how to put it. And um I'm really excited for it. I'm not gonna lie, I'm really excited to see everything around it, the clothes, the presentation, the marketing, who they select as models, it's all gonna be really, really cool. Let's not lie about that. It's all going to be pretty, pretty cool. And then in more Kanye news over the weekend, it appears like out of nowhere, um, we saw obviously images of Kanye out and about with um, his new muse and partner. It feels like in Julia Fox, who most of the lads will know from being that girl from um, Uncut Gems. that Everyone kind of was like drooling over because, you know, I think most men have a little soft spot for a PEA WGs. And if you know, you know. So um, when everyone saw them around town, I was thinking, oh, that's an interesting kind of hookup, whatever. But nothing more was thought of it. I, I don't know from my end of things, but then out of nowhere, this interview drops courtesy of Interview Magazine, where Julia Fox basically reviews and writes a little short essay about her whirlwind romance with um, Kanye West, which is flipping insane and really does kind of encapsulate everything everyone loves and hates about Kanye in it because it's insane in in its kind of sincerity right in the fact that you can clearly see a Kanye as a kind of old romantic in that respect right he loves to kind of make his partners especially in the beginning stages madly in love you know he likes to kind of um what's that thing called um he likes to uh fawn over them right um in any way shape or form and show his affection in many ways right in very sweet ways in terms of like you know what's that thing he did with kim where he proposed to her in that empty baseball arena sort of thing right it's just epic levels of niceness and the wedding i was done like really really cool but it's also an extremely you know um attention seeky lacking in lacking in kind of um it's, it's a very calculated move, right? Especially off the back of what's going on with Kim and Pete Davidson in terms of, oh, let me do a public get back, but also generate some clicks and also introduce my new moves and also remind people that I am who I say I am, right? I can make another, like he's basically the queen maker. So the king maker, right? He's the queen maker. Like I can take this lady who, you know, don't get me wrong, Julia Fox had a moment with Uncut Gems, but since then I don't think people can really pay much attention to her outside of maybe her baby mother, her baby daddy drama. But for the most part, the hype on her sort of died in the mainstream um as soon as kind of the the hype of uncut gems died because unfortunately that movie people didn't seem to like too much i enjoyed it don't get me wrong but some people didn't like it so for him to go and you know pluck or not pluck but for him to kind of select this lady and say hey i'm going to present her to the world and kind of change your perception the same way he did with kim is an extremely narcissistic thing to do especially you know under the guise of it being some sort of a loving this loving display you know what i mean so it's two twofold you know it's everything we love and hate about kanye but also i just like the essay i think the essay is pretty cool pretty cute i think the pictures are really nice and well done they kind of remind me a lot of the way uncut gems was actually filmed if anything it feels like a an extra scene like a bit of bonus footage right from a dvd or a little easter egg you'd find if you meant to click on a certain menu you know what i mean it sort of has a similar sort of deal in it not too sure if the photographer is the same person who worked as a director of photography on uncut gems i'm not really too sure but it does have that kind of feel towards it and it's just interesting it's just a really funny interesting thing to see because most likely you would imagine kanye probably saw um julia fox in the movie the same way we did maybe he's only seen uncut gems recently i was like oh my god who the hell is that right <laughs> when you saw that back he turned around he's like oh my god and then he obviously going to get in touch and then when you learn more about her you also find out that maybe they're destined for each other in terms of how chaotic bpd borderline personality disorder she is and her art background and the fact that she's a bit of a you know what would you call it a bit of a scene icon within the little new york art ho kind of art ho sort of scene thing you need to call it from what i'm seeing online but in general the, the essay is really sweet i'm not gonna lie so it's just saying the following um person interview magazine it says i met yay in miami on new year's eve and it was an instant connection. So they've met only on New Year's Eve. So it's not too long ago. And suddenly, you know, he's proposing a flipping um, photo essay on Interview Magazine. Epic. Um, his energy is so fun to be around. He had me and my friends laughing, dancing and smiling all night. We decided to keep the energy going and fly back to New York City to see Slave play. Quick note on that one, right? Especially off the back of all that fresh and fit nonsense and the manosphere people on YouTube. This is something that goes 
that's something that doesn't get you know stressed enough it's all well and good being the person that's high value and earning money and you know having this and having that and car whatnot but there's something to be said for a guy who has the ability to not only swoon and do over and you know seduce the date but also be a person who's personable enough and has the ability to make the friends of the date laugh as well and have a good time. That's always a sign that you're going to be somebody that the friends will approve of and also somebody that your date would actually be like, you know what, let's give this a shot if you're able to make the friends feel comfortable. And you don't really hear those guys talk about that thing in much, you know, it's always about what car they can get, how much money they have in a bank account. And then they get, and then they wonder why the women that they deal with are so dense or that they can come in and want to fleece them. If you're giving out signals that all you want is to attain a certain amount of wealth in order to allow you the ability to, you know, smash certain women because they're out of your price range now, you're always going to attract that energy and also they're going to use and abuse you if they need, especially if they've got more experience than you in that field. So Connie definitely knows the game in it in that respect. Make their friends laugh and you're also going to be guaranteed to have some sort of opportunity to see them again. Um, it continues here, says, um, yeah, his flight landed at six and the play was at seven and he was there on time. I was impressed after the play. We chose to dinner at the Carbone, which was one of my favorite restaurants, obviously. Um, I was, Carbone, supposedly, I've heard is some New York hip place to go and eat. Everyone kind of goes there. Um, I think the other place is Lucian's. I forgot the other one. Um, it continues, it says, um, at the restaurant, yeah, directed an entire photo shoot for me while people dined. The whole restaurant loved it. And they cheered us on while we were happening. While it was happening after dinner, Ye had a surprise for me. I mean, I'm still in shock. Ye had an entire hotel suite full of clothes. It was every girl's come true, every girl's dream come true. It felt like a real Cinderella moment. I don't know how he did it or how he got all of it there in time. He's a billionaire who can do what he wants in it. Like, how? What, how do you mean? How did he do it? <laughs> but I was so surprised. Like, who does uh, things like this on a second date or any date? Everything with us has been so organic. I don't know where things are headed, but if it's any indication of the future i'm loving the ride which again pure chaos energy because just the other day this girl was on social media from what i see on screenshots sharing or letting everyone know you know forcing everybody to know that her baby daddy was a deadbeat um and saying that you know he's a drug addict and he's not looking after the child and just you know doing what baby mothers do on social media where they get agit agitated with their partner not pulling the weight and then suddenly a couple of a few days later she's here you know um, getting dressed in D diesel designed by the Y Project um, designer and kind of the same sort of thing. Just the other day, he was at the Larry Hoover concert, you know, screaming Kim's name and wanting her back and mi remixing lyrics and using her name in it. And now suddenly here he is, you know, in the embrace of some other woman. <laughs> it's just, oh, I love the chaos. The chaos energy for me is what's really made me flipping laugh about this entire thing. Um, I don't know who the stylist lady is, if anyone knows. She looks familiar. At first, I thought it was the daughter of Thingamajiggy, of um, Michelle Lamy, um, who also works at Rick Owens. I thought that was her at first, but I'm not too sure if it is. But yeah, essentially, if you just listen to the podcast, there's pictures of Julia Fox in a hotel suite being dressed by Kanye with the rails full of clothes. All of it is diesel, so it looks like he's trying to be the queen maker for Ju Julia, but obviously he can't do the Balenciaga for him thing because, you know, that's Kim, so he's having to kind of bring in some new designers and he's plucking of course um diesel designed by glenn martins i think his name is of the of Y project obviously it's somebody that a lot of people like on the scene and has a very um, particular aesthetic when it comes to clothing and how he you know designs and cuts and materials he uses and whatnot and the stuff he's done for diesel so far especially his debut collection has been really nice so that's great to see and again here's them chilling you know her looking hot him looking cool and just the vibe is nice but yeah it just it definitely looks like something you would have seen as a bit of extra footage from uncut gems in it i think that's a poet i forgot his name that he was there too but yeah this picture in the hallway is fucking banging in it really really good man but it also shows how short kanye is right she's got pretty high heels on and he's got his big boots on and they're about the same height <laughs> but yeah this is super hot with a little thong hanging out there yeah really really good i'm not going to lie the whole shoe is amazing that's a brilliance with high, with low rise jeans, right? You can have low rise jeans and pull up your fingers and they can make them look really, I like the perception. It can make them look a lot more um, lower than what they are, especially because she looks like a quite a short, -y, short girl, right? In terms of legs wise, it does somehow elongate your legs as well. So that's quite cool to see. And of course, this is the images of them in Carbone restaurant, uh, modeling and doing the damn thing. And yeah, 
it looks pretty decent i'm not going to lie the whole thing is pretty entertaining to watch from afar another image again from them it's being styled somewhere kind of sipping on the wine of course it looks like it's a chardonnay man right Kosh. it's just great there the bunching doesn't work for me here but still yeah but yeah i wonder if that is the michelle lamy daughter maybe not maybe somebody else but i wonder what stylist that is that that buckle on the on the belt is questionable but yeah we keep it moving um but yeah all of it looks pretty sick man not gonna lie it looks pretty sick so whirlwind romance um all covered there by that little essay and then on the other side of things we've got some really interesting words here where is it um this one which kind of got me thinking about the um the importance of having cheerleaders friends of yours working in the press too you can kind of um when they get asked to comment on you as a person they're able to really big you up in a way that's a little bit delusional but it's also sincere and also acts as a great way for people to kind of um judge your character right because usually i think you know you could tell, tell a lot about people by the way they treat obviously service workers and also by the way that their friends describe them and i think this little excerpt courtesy of the cut where um sorry um what's her name oh what's the fucking white lady's name i follow on fucking social media uh, what's her name what is her name where is she do, do, do. Cat Marnell, that's the one, Cat Marnell. Yeah, Cat. So Cat Marnell here had some um, really interesting words to say about Julian Fox that I really liked. So the, mo the following um, at the bottom here, right? It says, I'm asked to respond to Fox's busy week. Cat Marnell, who's been friends with the actress since Fox was a teenager, texted me the following. Julian Fox is doper than Pete Davidson, Kim Kardashian and Kanye West combined, which is a big statement to make, right? She's legitimate sorceress. She's the Michael Jordan of Vixens. <laughs> I love the guest. She's devastating like a hurricane. And then she kept on going. If she if she became a legit minivan majority known household name as is happening right now, it will be the greatest thing to ever happen in my lifetime. I fucking love that bad bitch. Julia Fox is the Camille Pagler wet dream. Fox herself texted me and said the overall message is that if you're in a toxic relationship, get out of it because you never know who you know. You never know who. Yeah, because you never know. Because who never know who what, what's that thing? Hold on, let's say the overall message is that if you're in a toxic relationship, get out of it because you never who know or what could be waiting for you on the other side. Of course, you never know who could be waiting for you on the other side. Okay, some good message there overall, but the gas is supreme. It looks like all the white art hoes in New York City are loving it because I guess she's a bit of a star in their own little, you know, um sphere that they live in. Um, she obviously has a lot of friends so she's obviously a cool person it seems like despite the fame and whatnot and maybe generally this is kind of a new york cinderella story right this is a downtown new york art uh, cinderella story where the bit larger than life you know artist or famous person comes down to your little local scene and plucks one of your um you know seen hotties and takes them up to the highest of highs um i've seen some people debating whether or not you know this could have been dasha from red scare but i doubt it she doesn't have enough junk in the trunk probably for kanye but still it's an interesting thing to see um play out again in public and then if you're wondering oh this doesn't make any sense why they're together blah 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 i think this little video from this lady that i found on twitter which basically surmises and rounds up what julia fox is about is a good explanation as to why they're probably a lot more um aligned and compatible to each other than you'd actually would be led to believe so this is courtesy of twitter by a lady called Beyonce, but i'm going to play it here it's a tiktok video of some girl made basically summarizing who julia fox is as a person and as an artist okay so everyone is obsessed with julia fox right now the woman who is dating kanye west who is she? We don't really know besides the like hot uncut gems actress. So I took it upon myself to do a motherfucking deep dive on the internet and the stuff that this woman has done. While she was still in high school, she was a dominatrix. She made a film titled Fantasy Girls that was based on the true story of her and her friend discovering a prostitution ring and uncovering it on a road trip to Reno. She released two photo books 
They both include very explicit photos of her, not only sexually, but also photos of her getting abused physically, the aftermath of that, um, and also like screenshots of emails and texts of men emotionally abusing her. So she's like always been like very like outwardly vulnerable. Like every photo of her pre 2018 is like very explicit. And I think that this was done on purpose. Her Tumblr username was reverse cowgirl69, iconic behavior. Okay, so in 2019, um, Julia threw an art show called R.I.P. Julia Fox. And it's confusing whether or not she literally staged her own death or just like really leaned into it for the art show. Every photo from this art show um, was painted with her own blood. She extracted the blood with a syringe and then painted onto silk. I would show you guys, but community guidelines. She's definitely a girl that's like been through a lot, but I feel like she's so unfazed by all this new attention she's getting from Kanye. I feel like she's really been manifesting this for a while. She is mother to this beautiful baby boy. She's very, very unapologetically gone off on her dead baby daddy publicly on numerous occasions. Um, I really like her. I think she's smart. I think she's outspoken and I'm excited to see what she does with this new like level of fame. So yeah, in case you're wondering who she is, that is your summary. And uh, another reminder of just how important of a role TikTok is playing in culture nowadays, especially with their short format. Um, I've heard of people basically saying that they've completely shifted their um, food porn con their food porn consumption to TikTok. People don't necessarily even check YouTube because you always get those fucking intros of like, hi guys and all that sort of shit. Same stuff that I do, basically. And people just are a bit too long-winded. But obviously with the format only allowing you to what post up to two minute videos or whatnot um and you have to cut them down really and edit them and whatnot you you, you just get to the heart of the matter if you want to make a particular salad or a particular whatever dressing whatever you want to make you get just the details um what you need to get going and none of the fraff so maybe that kind of has extended now to other parts of culture in terms of art and whatnot bloody blah 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 so that was a pretty cool summary there from that young lady and again let's see what hap what comes of it, it let's see what comes of it um, it's a bit weird, it's a bit random, but again, I think it's a welcome distraction from the day-to-day -day horrors that we have to kind of put up with, especially when it comes to pandemic stuff. Like, uh, you know, as much as it cringes me out to talk about people's relationship status and what they're doing, hooking up and whatnot, I don't really care. Um, I still think it's a far better thing or a far more, it feels like something that you should be doing, especially considering the times that we're living in. I think cons consist spending most of your time consuming pandemic like content or covid content it just isn't the vibe it really isn't so you know as cringy as it can be and as manipulative or as calculated as it does appear because it does appear quite calculative quite manipulative in some way shape or form right we're all kind of complicit in playing this massive sort of public get back game that Kanye is doing at the moment you know she's Kim's out with Pete she's he's out with julius a little bit you know whatever i still would i still welcome this distraction i really do welcome this distraction and then talking about distractions and talking about distractions we have to talk about this um the weekend's album just came out the other week or this weekend this past weekend sorry um called dawn fm and my word is it brilliant um, alongside Gunner's album which i also enjoyed but i was really looking forward to listening to the weekend's album it sort of came out of nowhere he just announced it i think in december or something maybe the beginning and then it says it's going to drop the first week of june january it did live streamed i think a performance on amazon music which a lot of people have been doing i've obviously seen drake do it with the larry hoover concert with um kanye so obviously there's some sort of deal i guess with record labels to get amazon music up and running it feels like and obviously they're partly in, tied in with tiktok as well so that obviously makes some sense but damn as an album that kind of covers genres across what synth pop new disco um new wave electro it was legitimately up there with some of his best material especially this kind of iteration of the weekend this sort of like commercial weekend this is definitely the best iteration of it and again if you weren't a fan of kissland and you didn't really know where he was going direction wise i think so far this has been a great way to kind of end that sort of series that sort of sound it's been a great way to end it especially as i was thinking the other day since daft punk have decided to hang up the gloves 
that sound basically needed a new custodian and i think the weekend's maybe the best at doing it so far um he's definitely the most versatile he definitely has the best melodies the bass line like the song constructions are just like just otherworldly of course you can tell straight away the thing sounds fucking expensive i think when you're the weekend you're that level of artist you can pull in some big 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 wigs and if i'm not mistaken he's got guys from the beach boys he's got that really really popular and famous and successful pop writer max martin and many other people as well opn um kind of doing the project and lending a hand of course quincy jones the taylor crea feature little wayne blah 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 but just overall him as an artist man like in terms of consistency in terms of attention to detail in terms of all the promotional content like the the album cover with him kind of aged out right the same sort of mo for character he was in the previous one like it's just amazing like it really really is really 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 well done um so far i think when i listened to the album i couldn't get past gasoline and i had to go on the the weekend subreddit to find out that that's actually him speaking or sorry it's actually him singing just changed his voice i don't know how he did that i guess that must have been a consequence of maybe the the jim carrey friendship because supposedly the weekend and jim carrey have kind of struck up a friendship because the weekend's been obsessed with jim carrey because i think that was the first uh was it um the joker yeah i think the joker not joker sorry um what was that movie called that he's in you know what i'm talking about the one where he's the green character whatever you know what i mean right that was the first movie he watched in a cinema so he's been obsessed with um jeremy carey since then and um oddly enough they happen to live across the road from each other or near each other in la um they got put in contact they had this really cute moment where they kind of saw each other through telescopes um jim carrey then got him balloons and invited him out for dinner or breakfast i think for his 30th birthday which has sounded like a sweet thing to do and since then they've had a creative relationship and he's even featured on the outro of the i think he's featured on the intro and the outro of the album and then i just assumed that was jim carrey i don't know why i just assumed that would be a sick way to kind of introduce the album you got jim carrey singing a fucking john mouse type record on the beginning of the album but it's not it's actually him just I, I guess he might have pitched down his voice or he changed the annotation i don't know it just it's amazing get past get past gasoline and then the reason why i want to mention it is this track here with tired the creator right with an amazing um quick verse on their standout um lyric obviously being um signed the prenup right that's obviously going to be screamed at all the concerts when that gets played live so definitely um kudos to tyler for doing that but there's a line in this track called here we go again <sighs> If I was Bella Hadid's boyfriend, this off and on guy that she's been with her for a while, I would be. I would basically tell the weekend that it's on site. Like if we see each other in real life, because I imagine they would, they probably bumped. They're probably in the same circles. You have to be, you know. Let's go outside to the parking lot and and just throw hands quickly because this is so disrespectful. So this is um the track called "Here We Go Again" on the weekend's album. I think it's at like track six or seven, featuring um Tyler the Creator, and there's a bit here, right? Um, where he's basically it feels like talking about this new boyfriend and basically saying he doesn't match up to him and whatnot right so this is the following let's start from here um um yeah there's the, the flex here a quarter billion on and off here used to sing on love so oh, i love this guy and he said yeah um um, said you wanted your boyfriend jealous of a couple pics and you didn't expect to fall in love for me once you got this stick the city dark city dangerous your girlfriend's trying to pair you with somebody more famous but instead you ended up with somebody so basic faceless right obviously the guy that she's with now you know he's a little bit of a normal looking white male right it's not his fault it is what it is i think he's a creative director an artist or something i don't know um someone to take a picture and frame it imagine that someone saying that the huge juicy to that he says but instead you ended up with someone so basic faceless someone to take your pictures and frame it and new, my new girl she a movie star my new girl she a movie star i loved her right make her scream like neve campbell supposedly he's going out with him angelia jolie that's basically the rumors out there they're kind of having a little bit of a secret relationship but just imagine if my man said this about you in a song just imagine right your girlfriend shall appear you with somebody more famous but instead you end up with someone basic faceless and i think they got a link to it right you can see the actual picture of the dude um who she's kind of dating at the moment i think it should come up here yeah but yeah, it's flagrant, flagrant from the from, from Abel, my man. Yeah, this is the guy, this or the basic faceless guy. But my man Abel is a mad boy because I think it's been, a, it's been, it's been kind of floated on the weekend subreddit that Bella and the weekend have still been getting together behind the scenes, under the radar for a while, off and on. 
and maybe it kind of finally got put to bed when she obviously started dating this guy she's like oh enough's enough if you're not gonna if you're not gonna be serious with me let, let's just call it quits um but yeah even if that isn't the case still my man describing you as faceless and somebody that just takes pics for her like he's the one taking all her crazy like outfit pictures and shit <laughs> that's it they're quite good pictures don't get me wrong but god man what an absolute disrespectful bar but yeah drama aside the entire album's a banger um for me no skips i listened to it in the gym again I, I couldn't skip past gasoline for the first hour or so i was out and about and um i've loved it ever since it really really is good and kind of i feel sorry for gunner as well because gunner's album is really good too especially for that kind of sound if you're not into that kind of um gunner's harmonies and whatnot i think it's maybe his most versatile in terms of outputting and it generally is a good album um he's got a really good chloe feature on there which obviously they're dating too so that was a really good surprise but i think that album, that track is really good he's got a track called living wild um that's really amazing and opens up about his kind of health scares he's had over the years and just a really solid album he's got a couple of great future um features um young folks features on there just a great great album but unfortunately this weekend album is just on another level like it really is on another level and i really recommend if you haven't checked it out already please do the weekend dawn fm again this album is going to slap a lot more once we're out and about properly like once the world really really opens up and we're able to you know you know throw up shapes and tap our feet uh when you see this performed live or you see it played outside people are going to be losing their mind man like the bops the melodies the bass lines are off some hard maybe because i'm on my electro tip recently i've been listening to a lot of electro i've been listening to a lot of new wave maybe right i think i was recently listening to the killers album um i had rem i think which he mentioned as well i played recently um just out and about so maybe that's why it kind of connected with me but fuck man the album's good it really is good i recommend you check it out if you haven't already it's definitely definitely one of my favorites so far from the weekend i have to admit then we have to move on to this and say I was wondering, just as kind of like thinking out loud, if 2022 is going to be the year of the ugly sneaker, right? Because that, that was a thing for a, a short period of time, it felt like maybe 2014 to 2017, there was a really strong period where every shoe that came out was butters, right? And I think the kind of piece de resistance was maybe those feelers that everyone was wearing that are now being kind of co-opted by the Italian population, right? Italian girls seem to love those fucking feelers. You know what I mean, right? Those massive feelers, chunky boots. But since then, things have kind of, you know, slowed down a bit. People are not as kind of um, hell-bent on wearing the most butter shoes as possible. People try to be a little bit more you know maybe grown up a little bit more minimal a little bit more refined but after seeing these two jones kicks or whatever maybe called i think maybe the return of the ugly sleeker his comeback in rearing rearing hot form so this is courtesy of hypebeast the first one being these um kerwin frost adidas sneakers um very in line with what kerwin does with his other collaborations where it's all it's kind of you know a little bit kooky in their approach in terms of the fur and whatnot so there's one ugly shoe and then the other ugly shoe that i thought might be a good indication of where we're going in terms of trends going forward for the new year and stuff are these cactus plant flea market nike dunk lows sort of a re so sort of like a re-engineered nike dunk low they don't really look like one um if anything they look like you know they kind of remind me of they remind me of those kind of um 6.0s those kind of bmx nikes that they did for a while i'm not sure if they still do them it was like a little sub brand sub label thing like like a dunk sb obviously they were made for people that ride bmx it kind of looks like that but essentially it's a dunk that's been reimagined or re re-engineered and um yeah they're not the most appealing to the eye um i think i joked the other day on twitter that they look like the kind of shoe that you're gonna see asap bari wearing an absolute terrible outfit head to toe in money and it's got he's he'll, he'll, he'll wear like a 10 grand outfit that looks like he just you know he, he he got stuck in a in his wardrobe and stumbled out drunk or something but it kind of looks like that right that kind of look but in terms of the appeal and again in terms of just being categorically ugly this might be a indication of where we're going in terms of taste level for the new year this might be the direction get the most butter shoe that you can and try and present it in a somewhat tasteful way i'm not too sure how they're going to be presented in a tasteful way i'd imagine stuff like this you know would be worn by a certain subsect of our population especially the the more creatively minded it feels like you know, if you want to show people that you're into art or that you um i don't know 
uh, you might have some Takeshi Murakami prints at home. The best way to kind of illustrate that will be to wear something from Kevin Frost designed, right? It really does kind of send out signals to people in that regard. And if you also want to show that you're kind of part of the LA creative hipster glitterati, right? A great way to show it is to wear cactus plant, right? Cactus plant, whatever market it's called. Because I think the lady behind it is quite popular within that group. People seem to like her. So they tend to wear this as sort of like a silent signal to let people know, hey, you know, I'm part of the crew, you know, I got this for free. Da, 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 da. Um, but I've never really liked the aesthetic for me, personally for me. I've always thought it's a little bit too, um, uh, I don't know, it's just not for me. But in general, this might, again, signal the reintroduction of ugly shoes into the industry, into the scene. Yeah, and I'm not for it. I gotta be honest. <laughs> I like my ugly shoes, but I don't like them this ugly. I want them to be a little bit tasteful in their appeal. And also, I'm kind of done with dunks in it. Like I just that silhouette, that shape just needs to die already. But Nike, you know, they've invested a lot of money into reintroducing quote unquote. They reintroduced it. It feels like every other year back into the market. So obviously, they have gotta get their money's worth. And you know, Cactus Plant Flea Market is probably a great way to do so, especially with you know Travis being MIA now due to the whole Astro World incident. So maybe that's a good banker. I don't really know, but I've had enough personally. I don't want to see more dunks. So maybe it's a welcomed um, refresh that they don't look like a dunk. They kind of look a bit different, but still, they just ugh, I don't know, man. I'm I don't, maybe it's just me. I just I just I just want beautiful things again. I want there to be a level of um, not even taste, but just refinement. Um, I want them to say something that isn't, hey, here's my personality, right? Like, <laughs> maybe, I don't know, give me something else, Jeremy. You know I mean? That's just maybe what I'm saying. I don't know. M maybe I'm thinking too much deeply into it and it's not that deep and they're just shoes. But I just, I don't know. Everything about it, I don't like. Um, I don't want anything to do with it. I'm sure they don't want anything to do with me either. But, you know, that that's the story for another day. But let me know what you think in the comments. Do you like the reintroduction of these ugly shoes? Again, you've got the Kermit Frost Adidas. And you've got these newly reimagined Nike Dunks by Cactus Plant Flea Market coming very soon. Sometime this year, I guess, isn't it? Sometime this year. Look at them. Look at them. Look at them. Bloody hell, man. Anyway, um, next on the list here. So next on the list, next on the list, next on the list. Yeah, let's end it with this one. So this is a, I know, I, I've normally stopped talking about this sort of stuff on the podcast because, you know, I'd usually leave it for my videos, but I did try and live stream the other day, but unfortunately my computer died on me. So I'm just quick going to cover it now and then we can kind of let you guys go because I don't want to chew off your ear for too long. So it looks like my um, my buddy, my favorite guy, Brendan Shaw, decided to gift himself a Ferrari, joined the La Ferrari gang. And um, the only reason why I want to cover it because it's just an interesting timeline to kind of observe from afar, especially somebody who's been a kind of former fan of TFAT K and has kind of, you know, fallen out of love, I think, with the podcast and the guys in general. Um, just, you know, over the years, changing of interest, maybe them, maybe revealing past their personality. I wasn't really a fan of in general, but, you know, over time, you tend to kind of either become a bigger fan of the person that you listen to in terms of content wise or they start to reveal parts of themselves they don't necessarily like and then you sort of decide to kind of bounce and go the other way so for me it happened that way so it is what it is but in terms of what brendan's doing for his career going forward it is an interesting move because i think i covered it in my live stream that whatever who whatever you believe whether or not he got fired or he left on his own accord he's not a showtime anymore that showtime gig despite how low quality the Below the Belt show was, and especially towards the end, Food Truck Diaries, you know, the guy was just stuffing his face full of food and interrupting every two mid-seconds and not really conducting good interviews, even though the format of the show is really interesting and cool and a fresh kind of way to do interviews that isn't just sitting on the desk and talking face to face, but, you know, whatever. He, obviously, that's a big chunk of money, cash coming in that's obviously not there anymore. And I'm assuming, you know, the whatever money he was on contract wise was enough to basically allow him to do several things at once because you have to imagine at the time that he was at showtime he launched the thick boy thing he was doing a bunch of merch he put on shows so that funds i would imagine apart from the podcast allowed him to do different things so not having that funds that, that kind of consistent paycheck is going to be a bit of a hit and i think he mentioned in a video that he you know he's putting his everything his life savings into starting thick boy studios which is his kind of new venture that he's going to do his own content under which i've always thought was a bit of a oversight in terms of tfat k and what they've been doing 
I think over the years, I think it felt like they were being a bit lazy in terms of letting cast media handle all the kind of production y sponsorship marketing kind of things, you know what I mean? Behind the scenes. Whereas if they would have set up this kind of T5K media or studio things ahead of time, ages ago, most likely, even though the show shit, I still think nowadays it's shit. Back in the day, it was all right. But I still think if they would have done that earlier, they probably have been, they probably would have been one of the podcasts that got bought out or got licensed in one of those deals that you know what Joe Rogan did with Spotify and what recently your mom's house have done with um Sirius XFM right I think they would have done it honestly I think they would have been one of the shows that, that did it too because they've got a big built-in audience they've been doing podcasting for a while not as long as Brendan says he has but still it's been a while maybe more than seven years um consistently they haven't really missed many days or weeks and stuff apart from a few times here and there um you know they, they they talk about stuff that generally people seem to be interested in bloody blah 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 based in la i think they would have definitely been capable of securing one of those deals but they didn't they just kind of were willing and able or to just you know let cast media handle everything in that regard and you know in general it kind of ended up buying him in the bum because when brian callum got cancelled for that rape allegation he essentially had to kick him off the show because cast media are his bosses and they said he can't be on the show if you want sponsors and obviously you want sponsors to keep the lights on so brian Callan was no more but anyway he's doing it now so that's a good thing so he's doing it now he's got football studios things happening and you'd imagine if you're doing that and you're launching your own thing you all the funds at the especially the beginning time will be needed to be put into making that that media company or whatever it may be podcast cast network successful at the moment it's still a bit puzzling because supposedly i think Chappelle's show who's on the show he's got his own show based on his own channel um some other guy the fat one what's his name something lucas he's got a show coming i think that's going to be another show on another channel um mufasa the bg or bgl whatever his name is right he's got his own show that's on his own channel so it's not even listed under the same youtube channel it's all kind of segmented off i don't know what sense that makes it should have been better just to make it put all the shows under the thick boy studios channel just especially for the beginning to kind of get the numbers up on that place and then maybe you can kind of let them branch out later and then to build up that kind of brand identity and um just in general again flat out i don't really see how this kind of serves as any kind of inspiration or what does this do for his audience him them knowing that the guy that kind of either got fired or left showtime and then soon after sold his what his wife's g-wagon because supposedly it was too impractical then goes out and buys a two-seater ferrari for himself and then gets his dad to come down and sit in it with him it's like i i don't i don't understand i don't see how that's inspirational inspiring or makes any sense and also it just doesn't add up it feels like right this sort of feels like the purchase that you would see i don't know a kevin hart make a jamie fox a dave Chappelle, but a comedian of brendan schaub's abilities and you know should he really be buying a for i don't know again but maybe it's more of a sign actually which again is what people don't really realize maybe it's more of a sign of how successful he is in podcasting like vis-a-vis he has comedic chops because comedic chops you know let's you know they said about the better i think he's got the worst rated comedy special in the history of the world right but and it wasn't that good either if you're just watching it objectively but it just feels like such a outlandish buy especially considering that he's starting an entire kind of media company um off the back of you know a pretty tumultuous year in terms of the pandemic and not being able to do shows and the backlash they got from doing shows the entire year you know all that kind of thing it just feels a very very odd purchase to make but you know the car's lovely don't get me wrong you know he invited his dad to come down and i don't know pat him on the back for getting it it's a bit weird but i guess maybe they're really into cars as a family here's him outside of the ferrari dealership sitting in it so again it's it looks amazing but i don't necessarily see what this does for the fan base the media company uh, it's just a bit of a bizarre one really it just doesn't make that much sense of course i got i think got a bottle there if you watch a picture here um what is this picture feature let's see let's see let's see let's see come on my computer's always so slow and then of course there's obviously a picture of him in the gym also with his tattoo so i don't know i don't know i don't know and then um this is the last video to kind of close it out where he kind of speaks about feeling a bit conflicted about posting the ferrari photo shoot on his instagram feed 
which obviously he didn't feel conflicted about because he still posted it. If you feel conflicted about posting something like that, you'd only post a couple of pics, but he had a whole entire, you know, sh um, lookbook done. You know, the look back, the sitting and laughing with the dad. You know what I mean? Like the fucking Joe Rogan smile that he keeps doing all the time. Interesting. But yeah, let's uh, let's play and see what he says in terms of how conflicted he felt about um, uploading these pictures of him driving a Ferrari um, in the midst of a pandemic <laughs> where people are struggling to keep the lights on and unable to pay for tickets to go to his shows he's still able to buy a Ferrari so I think doesn't add up man it's kind of like you know it kind of reminds me of it reminds me of like the guy in your in your hood or area who kind of has a flashy car who has the girlfriend with all the design designer clothes but he's always at home you're thinking what does he do he obviously doesn't podcast he obviously doesn't look like a podcaster guy and he hangs around with some people that are not so savory either he's a drug dealer or he's the son of some baron or something right either way he's involved in some dodginess this is the same thing here the podcast isn't great t-fat k it's not that brilliant it was good before but it's gone to shit now um his stand-up isn't amazing so it's not like he's playing massive arenas right so he's not getting that much money from there and you think to yourself like is um what's that thing called is that mental health app advertisements and um what's that thing called uh that fucking water they put in the beer tin all those ad reads really paying for, for a ferrari something just doesn't add up it really doesn't make sense but again maybe i'm reading too much into it i don't know nothing about cars about financing maybe you can make it work but it just feels like a bit of a stretch and again for somebody who's trying who wants to build an entire media business the first thing you would do wouldn't be to go and buy a Ferrari, would it? It would be maybe to invest that money into the media business or have some cash to basically pull from and give yourself maybe a longer runway. I don't know. But anyway, let's, this is him explaining his um, his opinions about posting the car on his social media. Logan won't post any of his cars. You really won't post anything yet. And like, I think, can, like, I struggle with it. It's like, do you post this stuff? Like, is this like bragging stuff like that? And I think I come from, I was talking to Gianni Christian about this. And my girl, I think I come from a different kind of cut of cloth where we've been doing this show so long. That was a weird. Just stop there. You, have you noticed whenever he's like having to open up about stuff like this, he does that gulp thing. I wonder if that's like a, if that's like a um, involuntary reflex when either you're lying or you're going to say something that you feel might be deemed as contentious or like cancelable. I wonder. It's a weird kind of reflex, isn't it? Every time he's talking, he does this look. Like, Maybe it's just drinking. I don't know. Maybe it's just a drinking, but anyway, let's continue. Long? Like, you and I have been talking this mic so long. When we started, like, I needed money from you to buy t shirts to start Fight the Kid t shirts at a Kenny Fight Club. Like, I, I couldn't. Are you fucking kidding me? I could yeah. buy a Ferrari. So I think the fans have come up with me <laughs> and they, they, wow. they realize the hard work, but it's like, it's all of us. So I post that stuff to show, like, I'm an idiot, man. If well, I can do anybody this. Anybody can do it, right? That's what, that's what I'm saying. If I can do this. Too. Like, check this out, man. This who <laughs> I can do this. Of course you can. But can any of your co-hosts buy Ferraris? That's, that would be the flex. If he suddenly was able to be in a position where he could buy everybody in the studio a Ferrari or everyone a Rolex, that's cool. The funny thing is there was a video clip that went um, viral on this TFAT case subreddit where someone shared an awkward exchange between, like, Eric Griffin and Brendan on King of the Sting where he kind of asks you know, jokingly and not jokingly about the bonuses they're meant to get this year. And obviously they didn't get bonuses, right? So he's asking. And um, it's funny now seeing this timeline play out where Brendan awkwardly didn't want to talk about it or say why they didn't get um, bonuses or pushing it on camera. And then suddenly he's buying a Ferrari. It's like, what? Something's not adding up here. It just doesn't make any sense. And now he's trying to say he's using it as a motivational tool. It reminds me of when people were giving Meek Mill a lot of stick back in the day or a few years ago when Meek Mill kept posting stuff about Rolexes and, you know, private jets and stuff and he was basically saying that this is motivation for people that have been in the same environment or being brought up in the same environment i have which makes more sense if you're meek mill right you've definitely grown up you know in a rough environment you've had a rough life you've definitely from the quote unquote the mud so maybe there's more inspiration to be had from you posting a picture of you in a bentley truck but after a while there's only so many of those outlandish purchases that people are going to give a shit about right you do it once and you know people maybe be like, oh amazing you do it a second time it's a bit it's a bit boring um, and a little bit confusing why a rich person keeps showing us that they're rich. We know you are. Do you know what I mean? You don't need to keep reminding us. We, we're aware you have a lot of money. Um, I think the same thing's happening with Gucci Mane. I think recently Gucci Mane gifted his wife a box full of cash. I don't know how much it was. And you know, people are like in the comments, yeah, I don't know. Rich people giving, people, rich people giving each other expensive gifts. Like, <laughs> it doesn't make any sense. But Podcasting and stand-up, dude. Yeah. Stand-up and podcasting bought that Ferrari. Yeah. 
it's a cool. great thing. Yeah. I, uh, that's yeah. why I like to post that stuff. Yeah, I, I didn't. I didn't think that you were being. Bragging. Of I don't think that's you did. No, no, yeah. I mean, I just know you. I mean, I just know how much you love cars. I, I don't think you've ever made any bones about. Is it a little bit sad again, to pause it? Is it a little bit? Ain't it a little bit sad again? As a former fan myself, it's a bit sad to see how cucky Brian is when it comes to Brendan on this show. Especially you've seen clips of it. He's always quick to jump in and you know make sure Brendan's feelings aren't hurt to move the conversation along. If he sees Brendan feels a bit uncomfortable and just generally not be disagreeable at all, right? He kind of agrees with everything he said, doesn't really push back much, doesn't really question stuff. Um, and clearly, we know why, right? Because essentially, Brendan's been it saved his life right off the back of being accused of rape. The only real income it seems like he had was from T Five K, and obviously, um. Conspiracy Social Club he does with uh, Sam Tripoli but you can tell he likes spending most of his time with Brendan because his actual friend Sam Tripoli just happened to be a core cool comedic friend that was the first to jump out the window and defend him but I don't think they're really as close obviously as Brendan as he's with Brendan so he obviously enjoys that show more they started it together so the fact that Brendan was willing and able to still give him the money that he was due from the show during his cancellation even though he wasn't on it it's kind of bought Brendan Brian's loyalty for Brendan, you know, for life, you know what I mean? But it's quite sad to see as a show because I think the dynamic worked better when they were pushing each other's buttons, arguing back and forth, do you know what I mean? That famous argument where they were, where they were bickering about who had more street fights came off the back of them kind of trying to out-peacock each other. But now that Brian is like this kind of weak, meek shell of a person, you know, that little flick on his hair has gone, he shaved his hair, do you know what I mean? He just looks like a little bit of a subservient, like he's just happy to be there. And... um Brian Brendan's basically telling him what to think when it comes to how he should be perceived with his fucking outlandish Ferrari purchase that he has no business buying A for the level of comic that he is and B just considering that he's trying to start a fucking media company. It just doesn't make any sense. And plus, no. it's, plus I find it's it a I've, huge deal. Oh yeah. I mean it is it to is get is allocated a, ones a big I can deal. understand people yeah. being like, I'll look at him showing off, but I, I feel like you've always talked about cars and you know, part of it's like you're still super excited about it. You're is like, it, like, and it's, it's, it's my man drinking whiskey. Like, what time did they record this show? Is it in the morning or is it in the afternoon? Because whenever you see Brandon, like, he's always got a fucking glass of whiskey in his hand. It's fucking bizarre, isn't it? Again, because I'm a fan fan. Because I remember the times when he used to be really, he used to be bemused at why people drink and, you know, do drugs and whatnot. He used to always be like, nah, I'm clean, I'm clean. Do you know what I mean? He used to be really quite picky and braggadocious and quite arrogant about it. And now suddenly he's turned into fucking whiskey man. Jamie you know I mean? is fucking weird. Really, really weird. But you know, I guess it's hard to find hobbies when you're older, especially as a man. So maybe just getting into stuff like this, like, you know, cigars, whiskey, golf. It becomes these things that you can kind of geek out on about if you're a dad, right? You've got stuff to kind of distract you from the daily miseries of having to look after your kid and listen to your wife speak. <laughs> you're Passionate. kind of blown away oh, yeah. by it. Oh yeah. Also, I don't just, think I, I yeah. mean I, you know I mean people can say what they want, but I mean I think if you're if you're that honest about you're like holy shit I got a Ferrari. That's organic. It's kind yeah. of a big deal. Yeah, to be in the club, like to be in the. I mean club? I'm not in the cars, but I looked at it. I like, saw the, I saw the club, post. Man? I was like oh shit. Of course like, you to do. Be you in the I'm in the club. Yeah. My See, I didn't know that. Like either. they let me in the club, yeah. and now when they have what's that car thing you go to, Dad, in uh, North Northern California? What's it called? Daddy's Monterey, where they have the car show. Yeah, so they'll have the most exclusive Ferraris. The like. irony is, from what we know so far, from what we've seen on the internet, especially on the T5K subreddit, Brian, Brian's dad could have bought him that Ferrari if he wanted to. And also, Brian Callan's dad could have bought him seven. That, that's the irony of it, Jeremy. You know I mean? They're trying to act modest and somewhat like this is a sort of like rags to riches story. But let's be honest in it. Like, Jeremy, you know I mean? um, the, uh, the cards definitely fell in their favor when it comes to those sort of things. But that was basically what I wanted to touch upon in that one. Um, maybe, again, I don't know much about cars, so maybe there is a way you can afford a car like that um, and, you know, make it work if you don't have the liquid cash or maybe it makes sense. But I just think off the back of trying to start Thick Boy Studios, buying a Ferrari, um, especially a new one like that, I think, as I said, I think it's like a hybrid, like part electric, part gas. It's just an insane purchase. And also maybe kind of... Um, it's lacking in me. I won't say self awareness, but it's an interesting thing, especially when you consider the level of comic he is. It just seems a bit strange, right? It seems a bit strange, but you know, maybe this is the new world we're living in now, isn't it? Where kind of regular, we're kind of run of the mill, crappy comics, if they're able to have a popping podcast, can basically live like kings, can live like, can basically live outside of the level of their talent. That maybe that's what does that make sense, right? Um, because essentially podcasting is its own little career, it's not stand up, so maybe that's it makes sense that way. But you know, what can you do? What can you do? 
Anyway, that's the next music show, episode number 537. If it's your first time check out the show, thank you so much. I appreciate you. If you've enjoyed it and you think I've earned your subscription, you know what to do. Smash it and join. If you like the show, please leave me a thumbs up or a negative. I don't mind. If you've got any questions, leave them down in the comments below and I'll get back to you. And if you're listening via the podcast app, you're listening specifically through Spotify, please leave me a review on there. They've got a review system and a rating system now, so make sure you just leave a couple of stars on there. That'd be greatly appreciated so people know that people are listening and watching the show. And until then, I'll see you guys very soon. Take care. Be safe. Be safe, my friends. Be safe. Of course, if you listen to the audio version, you hear a song. If not, you just have to hear it close out as per normal. Peace.